science. Hello and welcome to CSI Science. Fingerprints. We all have them and they are one of the oldest forms of forensic science. And it's pretty straightforward. You dust for fingerprints at a crime scene, run the prints against the database and voila, it's a match, right? We've all seen it on TV shows like this one. All you do is put your index finger on the glass and voila, you're in the system. Oh, cool. As we speak, the program is filtering through a database filled with millions of prints. The majority of them were recorded after somebody's arrest. So assuming that you haven't served any hard time, I doubt we're going to get it. So there you have it. You just take your fingerprint, you pop it in the computer, there's some words, some beeps, some clicks, and bam, there you have it. It's a match. Easy peasy. But... In 2004, an American citizen was arrested and imprisoned based on fingerprint evidence, only to be later released. So, what went wrong? There's been a devastating terrorist attack in Spain. Without warning, a coordinated series of rush hour explosions struck three train stations in Madrid. In 2004, a bomb ripped through a train in Madrid, killing 193 people and injuring around 2,000 more. Forensic investigators found fingerprints on a bag at the scene that contained the detonators. They dusted them, lifted them, and they sent a copy to the FBI in the USA. The FBI ran the fingerprint through their databases and it's a match. The fingerprint matched that of Brandon Mayfield, an American lawyer who had recently converted to Islam. He was arrested and taken into custody. There was only one problem. He hadn't been in Spain. In fact, he hadn't left the country at all for years. So what went wrong? Fingerprint analysis works on the assumption that everyone's fingerprints are unique. But how do scientists measure this uniqueness? Forensic scientists examine features in fingerprints called whorls, loops and arches. But matches are not made on the whole fingerprint, but by comparing individual features of the prints. So how many of these features does a fingerprint analyst have to look at before they can decide that it's a match? The answer is, it depends. In the USA, there is no rule about the minimum number of matching features needed to declare a match. But isn't it all done by computers these days anyways? Yes and no. In the case of Brandon Mayfield, the FBI's computer database compared the print to 45 million people in its database and it returned 15 potential matches. But these matches still had to be examined by forensic scientists. Yes, that's right, actual people to determine the final match. And it has been found that cognitive bias and context can influence the result of fingerprint analysis. Researchers from University College London gave a crime scene print and a suspect print to five analysts, and they all correctly identified that the prints match. But five years later, they very sneakily gave him the same pair of fingerprints. But this time, they told him that these prints were the print from the bag found at the Madrid bombings and the print that the FBI matched to it. That is, they set up the false expectation that these prints would not match. Only one forensic scientist still said that the prints were a match. Three changed their mind and now said they weren't a match. And one said that they now could not decide. So, in the case of the Madrid bombings, were the FBI fingerprint analysts influenced by knowing the suspect's background and religion? An investigation into the botch up said no, that they didn't know these things when they made their initial match. But the same investigation did admit there were questions about why it took them so long to revisit this match and release Mayfield from prison when the Spanish police had already arrested another suspect, someone who was actually in Spain. Well, that's all from me today, but be sure to check back soon for the next video where we'll be putting the science into CSI. It's... Thank <laughs> you.